you so much, praise team. You're aware that churches are not businesses, but our facilities, our buildings are uh, considered, at least by the city and county and the state, to be uh, commercial properties. And as such, that means that we uh, have to have regular inspections made by the, uh, by the fire inspector. And so um, th that was true in, here at, at Gate City. Uh, every year a fire inspector shows up to walk through our buildings and check things out. It was also true uh, for the church where I served in Charlotte. And that was my first experience with this. And I, I remember uh, the first time a fire inspector showed up and, and they show up without announcement. I mean, they just kind of show up one day and say, hey, I need to walk through your buildings and make sure everything is as it should be. And so I'm walking around with this inspector and virtually everything that he's noticing or pointing out are just fairly innocuous things. There are uh, some uh, extension cords that we can't use. We need to get rid of those and uh, making sure you do this, replace this bulb and that exit light, that type of thing. But when we get into the lower floor of the education building, things were really different uh, because uh, there was a staircase that was of concern to him. Now, this particular staircase, uh, both ends of that education building had these, these kind of like over in our building, there's metal staircases, and they had uh, closed underneath one of them to make it a closet. That actually was not against code, but you had to make sure that whatever was in that closet was not flammable because you don't want, obviously, to have a fire, and then people can't get out because your staircase is on fire. Anyway, uh, th this church had for years uh, led these and conducted these projects in West Virginia, these building projects, each summer where uh, it would be helping to build a church, uh, renovate a church, build a parsonage, do something like that to help some struggling churches in West Virginia. And so there were these building materials that needed a place to live. And so where they lived uh, during the year was underneath the staircase. And so when he looked in there, you've got some, some uh, cases of nails. That's okay. There's some hammers and that type of thing. Uh, what he was concerned about is that there were bundles of shingles. There were gallons of paint and there were three propane tanks. In case you're wondering, if a fire inspector finds three propane tanks underneath your staircase, bundles of shingles and gallons of paint, they're not gonna be happy with you. And so he said, you need to get this out of here now. And it, it's, it's not that this is a potential fire problem. You, you've got a bomb underneath the staircase and you, you, you just, you can't have that. You just can't have that. And so it probably takes a little imagination to realize this. If you wanted to fail a fire inspection, putting propane tanks, shingles, and gallons of paint underneath a staircase, pretty good way to ensure that's going to happen, isn't it? You can guarantee that you're going to fail that inspection. You know, th that whole concept of planned failure, that seems kind of ludicrous, doesn't it? Who would actually plan failure? The reality is, though, regularly we plan failure. I mean, for example, uh, students in school, you uh, choose not to study for a test, you choose not to do your homework, well, then you can plan on that you're going to fail the test and maybe even fail the class, right? Uh, you can, no, nobody would say, you know, I really want to get fired, but if you consistently make the decision and choice to keep coming in late and there are assignments at, at work that you just simply don't do and the boss asks you to do something and you simply don't do it, well, you can almost guarantee the fact that they're going to say, hey, we need to part ways and you're going to lose your job. We may not regularly think about the fact that we are engaging in planned failure, but too many times we are. Now, as someone, if you're a follower of Jesus, you'd say, I've got a personal relationship with Christ. Let me ask you this question. Is that something you want to fail in? I mean, do you actually want to? And is there in, in, the, in your mind right now this decision? I would really just love today. I'd love to fail Jesus. I mean, this one that gave his life for me so that I could have a personal connection with God so that I might be able to be forgiven of my sins so that I might be able to go to heaven. I'd really love to fail him. I mean, the fact that you're here this morning is testament to that fact, right? No, you, you would say this is testament to the fact I don't want to do that. But unfortunately, regularly, as followers of Jesus, we are operating with respect to our relationship to Him, barreling towards failure. This morning, we want to think about that question because its answer is consequential to us. But the question very simply is this. If I wanted, if you wanted to intentionally fail Jesus, what could you do to make sure that would happen? If you wanted to intentionally fail Jesus, what could you do to make sure that that would happen? You say, well, that's kind of a dumb question. Well, it's actually an important question because if I can identify those things, hopefully I can decide and make the choice today. I want to make sure I'm steering clear of that instead of actually heading down that route. 
So, how do we answer that question? Look with me in your Bibles today to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, as we're continuing in a series that will lead us to Easter next week, a series called Three Days in Denials. We're looking at Peter, and last week we saw this dramatic profession of his, and we're going to see how he responded with uh, that dramatic profession today, unfortunately, as he failed Jesus. But in doing so, it helps answer the question for us how we can avoid it. Look with me, starting in verse 69. There we're told that Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl approached him and said, You were with Jesus the Galilean too. But he denied it in front of everyone. I don't know what you're talking about. When he had gone out of the gateway, another woman saw him and told those who were there, This man was with Jesus the Nazarene. And again he denied it with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there approached and said to Peter, you really are one of them. Even your accent gives you away. Then he started to curse and to swear with an oath, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken where he said, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Of all the things that you can say about what Peter does here, I think we'd have to admit Peter fails Jesus on this night. But seeing how it happens to him might help inform us and answer the question, if I wanted to fail him, what would I, want to do? What would I do? And by recognizing that, hopefully choose not to do that. So what might guarantee failing Jesus? The first thing I would say based on what we see here with Peter is this, stumble and do not get up quickly. Stumble and do not get up quickly. Some of you could say, well, man, I did that this morning. <laughs> um, talking about something different here. It is Thursday night, the last week of Jesus' earthly life and ministry. The week started on what we celebrate today, Palm Sunday. He had had this dramatic entrance into Jerusalem. Uh, crowds, in fact, the, the gospel writers tell us that Jerusalem shook with excitement. People are waving palm branches and shouting Hosanna. Kids are laying their cloaks down and people laying their garments down so that the animal Jesus is riding on its hooves don't even touch the ground. Jesus is a superstar on Sunday. But by the time we get to Thursday, things have changed. And on Thursday, they have been celebrating the Passover meal. Every faithful Jew would have been doing this. Jesus has done this with his disciples before, but on this night, he's done it for the last time. We looked at that passage last week where Jesus celebrated the Passover meal. He infused it with new meaning in ways that the disciples didn't quite get. But then he said, because of me, every one of you is going to stumble tonight. And we looked at what Peter said in response to that. He was like, fat chance, Jesus, that's not going to happen. Even if everybody else does, I'm not going to deny you. In fact, even if it costs me my life, I'm with you. I'm with you to the very end. And Jesus tells him, listen, before the rooster crows tomorrow, three times you will have denied me. Peter hearing that, he doesn't argue, but you've got to think in his mind, he's thinking... I haven't seen Jesus be wrong about anything before, but maybe this is the first because that's not going to happen to me. Jesus, at this point, he heads to Gethsemane, which is where uh, we had, when we finished the passage last week, that's where things head. And so Jesus goes to the disciples, except for Judas, who's gone to consummate his betrayal. Uh, and so Jesus is with the eleven. He's praying there in the garden. And the quiet, the solace, the serenity of that moment is interrupted by a gaggle of people showing up. You've got Judas with soldiers, with the religious leadership. They arrest Jesus. <coughs> Excuse me, they take Jesus into custody. And at that point, there begins this series of, of just sham trials that are going to result in Jesus being crucified the next day. At this point, by the time we get to uh, verse 69, Jesus is on trial before the, the, the Sanhedrin, this religious body. As that is going on, Jesus is in this facility, this room, this building, wherever it is that they are gathered, and Peter is apparently on the outside somewhere. How, how close he is, I don't know. The sense that I get in my mind is that he's, he's hoping maybe to hear what's going on. Maybe, um, I don't know, he's, he's, he's curious, he's scared, he's... He's just trying to figure all this stuff out. 
And as that is going on, it says that he's sitting in the, outside in the courtyard. And this is how I imagine Peter. I imagine him sitting there kind of zoned out. Because I think I would be. And just trying to figure out, how in the world did this happen? I mean, on Sunday, everybody was waving palm branches, and now he's arrested. On Sunday, people were saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And on, now they're talking about killing him. What was, what was Judas? What's, what's going on? Everything that I have known, everything that I, I had taken confidence in, all that seems to be sh shaking. And all of a sudden, we're told that this servant girl approaches him and says, hey, you, you are with Jesus too. And I just picture him looking up from almost a stunned daze. He's been checked out. And then he says, I, I don't even know what you're talking about. Well, was he with Jesus? Absolutely he was with Jesus. He's been with Jesus for three years. In fact, he was one of this group that had left and sacrificed so much to go and follow Jesus everywhere that he went. And they had been bathing in the pool of Jesus' wisdom and his insight and his teaching and his compassion and his miracles for three years. He has been fully vested. And even by his own admission, he had just told Jesus, not decades before, not years before, but just moments before, hey, I am with you even if it costs me my life. And now a girl says to him, weren't you with Jesus? Uh-uh. I, I, I don't even know what you're talking about. Well... At that point, we're said that he, he went out of the gateway. And so he, apparently he's been close to where Jesus was, and he's gotten a little further away. And at this point, another woman sees him, and she says, Hey, this guy was with Jesus too. I mean, Jesus is in there being interrogated, questioned. He's experiencing this hearing. This is one of the guys that was with him also. In, in verse 72, we're told what? It says, this time that Peter denies it with an oath. And so the, the thought is, at this point, I am not just simply saying, I don't know. I, I promise you, I, I have no idea who Jesus is. And at that point, we're told that a little while passes, and then there were those that were standing, and they approach Peter, and they say, and likely they have heard this exchange going on before, and they said, you know, we, we really think you are, you're, you're one of those guys that was with him. We can even tell by your accent. It's kind of like with me. You assume that I'm from Boston, right? And so we can tell by your accent you're one of those people that was with, with Jesus, this, this Galilean. And at this point, what does Peter do? It says that he starts to curse and to swear with an oath. I don't know the man. It is only at that point that you hear at the end of verse 74 immediately a rooster crows and all of a sudden the curtains are pulled back, the light shines and all of a sudden it's as if Peter realizes oh boy look at what I've done. Now hear me in this I have no intent, no desire to beat on Peter this morning to suggest that somehow I am or you are, that we're better than him. What I want us to see is that Peter is just like me and he's just like you. In fact, he's probably better than me and better than you. This is a guy that has left so much and sacrificed so much to follow Jesus and yet he is failing him. And I don't want to overstate the case, but can we not agree that this is a failure? It's a failure on the part of Peter. He's not just saying... You know, um, I'm not willing, I'll, I'll back away from Jesus. I'll, I'll stop this whole ministry thing, uh, if, if that's what's required. He's saying, I don't even know who this guy is. He is completely removing himself from any association with Jesus by his statements that are growing in their fervor and in their clarity. He's saying, I have no idea who that guy even is. No association, no linkage whatsoever. Hopefully we can agree with the fact that is a failure. You say, well, I don't know necessarily that that could happen to me. I don't know that it could happen to you. I don't know what could happen to folks uh, in my family. We're, we're followers of Jesus. I don't know exactly how we could fail him like this, but it's entirely possible, even this past week. Maybe it was with, a, with a, one of our students at school this past week. Maybe it was an employee that was having a conversation with someone in the break room over lunch. Maybe it was 
one where one of our seniors was engaging a waitress at a, a restaurant, but how it is that you responded, how it is that the, the manner in which you engaged in conversation, you were clearly representing yourself as someone that doesn't have a connection with Jesus. Maybe it was a stated denial, but maybe it was just operating in such a way it is so at odds with how Jesus would operate. It's so at odds with the teachings of Jesus that you are failing him by effectively distancing yourself from him and from his example. What I'm trying to say to you is that what Peter did, I could do. What Peter did, you could do. But the truth is, if you want to make sure that it happens, you want to ensure that it happens, will operate in ways where if you have an initial stumble, if you fall, wallow in it. Don't get up. Just stay right where you are. I had been doing uh, fairly well for some time, but the reality is in recent months, I know this is a shock to you and you're just a gas, but I've gained some weight. Um, regard, I know still that uh, looking remarkably good, and I understand that, but... Uh, my clothes are full. They are very full. And um, I need to do something about that. And I was thinking about how all that began. And we had, uh, our whole family wound up with COVID, end of August, 1st of September. And uh, the strain that I had uh, affected me where, among other things, I completely lost all sense of taste. Some of you would say, Mike, you didn't have taste to begin with. But just, anyway, in fact, I remember even Philip gave me this taste test. I mean, like I'd close my eyes and he'd put stuff in my mouth. I mean, sincerely, an entire tablespoon of garlic, diced garlic he put in my mouth. I had no idea what it was. Really, really crazy strange. And so here we are. We've got COVID. You're, you're kind of stuck in quarantine. You're not supposed to go anywhere or do anything. So we're just at the house. And um, I don't feel particularly bad. I, I just, uh, I'm sick. I need to make sure that I don't spread this to anybody else. And there's not a whole lot that you can do. And so I'm hungry. But I can't really taste anything. Now, that being said, you could get the faintest hint of sweetness at the back of your throat. The faintest hint. And I, I don't know why, but at, at Sam's I had bought this container of Toll House cookie mix. That pre-made stuff. Well, there's nothing else that we can do, so I'll just make some cookies. And here's what's really strange. I, couldn't, I really couldn't taste them, but my mind knew cookies are good. So what did I do? I kept making cookies. And Caroline said, why, why are you, why are you keep them, why, why, you can't even taste them, why are you doing this? I said, I don't, I don't really know, but my mind knows that cookies are good, and so I kept making them. And so that was in the fall, and then all of a sudden you hit Thanksgiving, and you hit Christmas, and like you're, you're making stuff at home, you're, there's stuff at church, you get family together, and there's all this food around, especially so many sweets. I love sweets. And so at this point, I realized I've already had to loosen my belt a little bit, and there was a sense in which I was like, oh, oh well. You know, at Thanksgiving and Christmas, it's not like, uh, would you like a piece of pecan pie? It's like, we have pecan, we have pumpkin, we have sweet potato, we have cake. What would you like? Yes. <laughs> and so you have some of all of it. And unfortunately, I, I've kind of gotten on that train and let's be honest, it's a happy place to be. In fact, more of us ought to resolve to gain weight because at least we could make sure we do that. Um, but it's fun to eat whatever you want. It just is. And all these things that taste good that um, make your clothes miserable. And so now I'm at this point and there's, there's this realization that I have. You don't, just, you don't go to bed one night and your clothes fit and you wake up the next day and they're tight. It, it doesn't happen that way. And so how did it happen for me? This is how it happened. It started where I, I stepped out of line. And I was eating some of this sweet stuff, but I knew I shouldn't. I couldn't even taste it. But my mind says that that's good, and so I, I kept eating that. Well, we get to Thanksgiving. Oh, it's, it's holidays, but I've already been eating these cookies. I've already gained a few pounds, so I, it's okay. By the time we get to Christmas... I mean, it's, 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 it's Christmas, and I've already, I've, already been, I've already been just kind of out of bounds anyway. I've already kind of been operating out, out, out of the, the lines. And what happens is that you finally get to a point, you're like, well, I haven't, I mean, I'm so far gone. Might as well enjoy it, right? Supersize. 
Yes. How did it happen? It happened because there was this initial step where I made a decision, I'm going to eat that which is not best for me, that's going to make me a little bigger. And once I've done that, that made the next step a little bit easier. And it made the next step a little bit easier. And it made the next step a little bit easier. That's why I had a milkshake last night. <laughs> why? Because of the step I took back then. What I want you to understand is, relative to dieting, if you stumble and don't get up quickly, very quickly, you're going to find yourself repeating that over and over and over and over again. This started, this process happened on that night, not simply because Jesus said to Peter it was going to, but Jesus knew what was going to happen because he's God the Son, and Peter was a guy that initially had this, just a girl come up to him. This is not some adult, this is a child that says, hey, weren't you with Jesus? And he's like, no, I have no idea what you're even talking about. And then it doesn't happen just once. It happens twice. It happens three times. We're not even talking about in a span probably of 12 hours. Not even a whole night. Three times this has happened. Why? I think in part because Peter stumbled and did not get up quickly. And that will ensure, ensure your failure. This rooster crows after Peter has denied Jesus three times because... Peter stumbled, he failed, and then didn't get back up and say, Lord, help me, forgive me. And when we choose not to do that, the next step comes more rapidly and far easier. If you want to ensure your failure of Jesus, well, stumble and do not get up quickly, but there's another thing you should do, and that's this. Embrace failure's growing intensity. Embrace failure's growing intensity. There are some small details in this passage you could easily overlook. What's adamantly uh, or, or crystal clear from this is that there are three times where it is alleged to Peter that he has association with Jesus, and three times in the span of this one evening he denies what goes on. But pay attention to the detail of this. At first, this servant girl approaches Jesus and says, Hey, you're, you are with Jesus. And at this point, what does he do? He's like, I, I don't know what you're talking about. He feigns ignorance. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I really don't know. But notice what happens the next time. He, he goes out of that courtyard area, past the gateway, and another woman sees him and says, Hey, th this guy here was with Jesus, the, the Nazarene. And look at his response. He doesn't simply say, I don't know the man, but he says, it says that he denied it with an oath. What does that mean? I mean if you deny something with an oath, you're essentially saying this. Listen, I promise you. I promise you, I mean, I have no idea who this, this guy is. And so what he's trying to do is to make a statement and underline it, put it in all caps, bold it. He is expressing with increasing clarity, I've got no association with him. And then it says, after a little while standing there, uh, there were those that approached and said, you really are one of them. Even your accent gives you away. But notice Peter's response in verse 74. It says, he started to curse and to swear with an oath, I don't know the man. Well, you don't have to have served in the Navy to kind of guess what's going on here with Peter. Add a few blankety blanks here and a few blankety blanks there, and that's kind of, well, you can get what Peter is saying to them. It's not just simply, I, I pledge to you that I have no awareness. I mean, he is using foul language to underscore and as bold a way as he possibly can. I have no association with that guy. I don't know him. Don't, I have no interaction. I have no relationship. I have no association whatsoever with him. Every one of these statements, Peter denies Jesus. All of that, that's the common denominator in each of these. But is there a difference? Yes, there is. In each of them, what happens? It's as if the volume gets turned up. At first, it's like, you know, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. The second time is, no, I, I promise you, I don't know what, what, what you're talking about. In the third case, blankety, 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 blank, I swear to you, I have no idea who this is. What, what's happening? It is growing with intensity. Not only did he, did, he, did he stumble and not quickly get up and turn, that made the next failure, the next misstep, the next disappointment, the next acting out of bounds easier, 
But what happens is that it grew in its intensity. And in the scheme of things, with respect to me and you and your relationship with the Lord, that's exactly how it operates. And it is not until this rooster has finally crowed that it dawns on him what he has fully done. And when he did not get up quickly from the first fall but wallowed in it, it is not simply that he continued to fall, but the extent to which he did grew. It got even worse. The denial started with, I don't know what you're talking about. And then by the end, he's using the foulest language he can come up with to communicate as much distance as there can be between he and Jesus. I have had some back problems for a number of years now. I had a spinal fusion done back in 2017, I think. And um, there's still some issues that go on my lower back. I've had some problems with my neck as well. And uh, that led me last year to go see my neurosurgeon again. And uh, one of the things that he did was to order some physical therapy. And some of you have maybe for back issues or something else, you've gone to physical therapy. And one of the things that they, uh, they did was, uh, in, in addition to these, these exercises and these uh, stretches and, that they had me doing, they connected me to a TENS unit. Are you familiar with those? Uh, a TENS unit is this electrical device where they take... Um, these stickers and apply them to various places that they want to, to stimulate with some low voltage electrical current. And the goal is that you send that current through those, those stickers that are connected to your skin and it sends these electrical pulses into those muscles to cause them to relax. And if, if there's tightness to, to loosen and so that if there's pain to hopefully decrease that. Anyway, I remember the first time that they connected me to this thing and at first as they're doing that, you think they're getting ready to ask you a series of questions. Is this true? <laughs> no, but so they've connected all these wires to me and uh, the, the guy starts and all of a sudden I felt like I was having a seizure. And, and, and I'm like, like, like this. And he said, oh, oh, okay, I'm sorry. He said, L let me turn that down. That's, that's too much. That's too much. And so at that point, what he did was to start it off on a program where it begins... You just feel a little bit of twinge. And after a period of seconds, it gets a little bit stronger. By the end, we get to where we started, but I'm okay at this point. I mean, I, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm riding some rodeo bull at this point. I, because I've, I've, what has happened? I've, I've gotten used to it. It started off small. It got a little more intense. It got a little more intense. But I was able to deal with it because it happened gradually. Listen, that's exactly how our failure of the Lord and our failure in our relationship with Him works. It doesn't start typically by an absolute jump off the cliff. It happens by a step here, a step there, over time, and you finally, all of a sudden, the rooster crows, and you are shocked at how far you've gotten away. And how did it happen? Well, you could have guaranteed it was going to happen. You really could have. Because when there is failure and you don't get up quickly and you wallow in it, the next step comes much easier. But as the next step comes, it tends to grow in its intensity. And initially it may be that you just act like or you feign some sort of disassociation with Jesus. You don't want necessarily for people to know that you've got a relationship with Jesus. But then it can grow to the point where you are acting like somebody that, that has never experienced a relationship with God, who is completely operating out of bounds and is living absolutely in a godless direction. It doesn't happen overnight. It happens incrementally. And if you embrace failure's growing intensity, you can guarantee it's going to happen. So, so what do you do? What do you do? So I don't want to ensure my failure of Jesus. I would rather seek to operate where I'm ensuring that I stay in bounds and that I keep following. And what do I need to do? Well, I think the first thing that we need to do is this. You need to admit your weakness. I need to admit my weakness and realize I am subject to falling at any point. And I didn't need to realize, if it could happen to somebody like Peter, it could absolutely happen to somebody like Michael. It could absolutely happen to somebody like you. And it's, it's part of doing what Paul encouraged, where he says, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Realize that you are a person of weakness. But then, make following Jesus a daily choice. 
don't just decide. You know, I, I made a decision to follow Jesus back then, and that's when I became a Christian. I, I believe that salvation happens once, but I believe the decision to follow Jesus is something that we make on a daily basis. I'm choosing today to follow Him, to follow His lead, to follow His example, to follow His standards, but then repent regularly and often. Repent regularly and often. When I realize that I have failed Him, don't wallow in it. But come to him and say, Lord, this is what I have done. I don't want that to be what I continue to do. I want to change now. I want your forgiveness and help me to turn in the opposite direction. It should be that my walk with Christ and that your walk with him is not one where we are planning failure, but where we are choosing planned and consistent commitment. Ultimately, you're planning to do something in your relationship with Jesus today. You are, consciously or otherwise. You are planning by your choices to do something with Jesus today. Let me just ask you, what ultimately are you planning to do? Will you bow your heads with me?